Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. So I have been looking forward to recording this episode for months now, so I'm really excited. Today's episode is with Tom Jessen, and Tom and I talk through everything you will want to know about sciatica, radicular pain, radiculopathy, referred pain, and everything in between. And then we talk about corda equina syndrome. The whole purpose of today's episode is for you to feel comfortable and confident with these terms and how you're assessing them and what are you looking for. And also really importantly, how are you going to explain it to your patients? And to do that, you need to understand these terms. And Tom does that fantastically. Just a quick shout, if you can help the channel by clicking the subscribe button, it helps us reach more people across the world, which is all I'm aiming to do with this channel. So without further ado, let's roll the video and have a chat with Tom. See you on the other side. Wow, well, today, as I said in the intro, really excited to to have Tom Jessen on the on the, the channel today to, to talk us through lots of things, including sciatica, corda equina, and, and all the things in between. And and what I'm really excited about today is we're just going to really break this down to try and make some of these terms, some of these things a little bit more manageable, approachable, and, and actually calm some of those nerves down that we are. I know I had as a student, as a new grad around some of these areas. So Tom, welcome to the channel and tell us a little bit about yourself for those you know, under a rock who don't know anything about you. Yeah, well, thanks for getting in touch, James, and inviting me. I appreciate it. It's a great channel. Uh, you know, I wish, I don't think, we well, certainly hadn't started when I was a student. Uh, you know, I wish, I wish you had. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm Tom. I'm from the north of England. I'm from Newcastle. And uh, but I'm talking to you from Houston, which is why it's sunny outside. The sun's coming in. It's like one o'clock here. I'm a physiotherapist by trade, um, kind of bog standard GP pain clinic, that sort of thing. But I've also developed a, a keen interest in sciatica or lumbar radicular pain or lumbar radiculopathy or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I know that's probably what we're going to talk about today. Um, and in that time, a little bit of peer reviewed research and uh, a couple of books and, and many, many blog posts and newsletters and things, um, which is all work that, that I do independently. So hopefully uh, I have one or two interesting things to say today. Brilliant. OK, so what we'll do, we'll get straight away started on that. And I've picked these things from some of the, the, the questions that I've had been sent into us and also there's some of the things that I knew that I struggled with when I was a student and so some of the people watching this may know these terms be comfortable with them but I know there's going to be an awful lot out there that really aren't and feel quite sort of maybe apprehensive about these so let's kick us off sciatica radiculopathy radicular pain we hear these terms can you mm -hmm. talk us through Tom some basics yeah. about what's what are the differences what are we talking about so um, they're all different kinds of spinal pain uh, that goes into the, the arms or into the legs. So if you have neck pain that goes into the arms or low back pain that goes into the legs, then we're in this territory of these words, sciatica, radiculopathy, radicular pain, referred pain, this kind of collection of, of words, which, uh, you know, James, as you said, many people, even quite far into their careers and, and, and um, actually many very advanced clinicians who aren't specialized in this stuff don't know the meanings of they, they don't know the word the true meanings of these words um but once you do know uh it helps you to see a lot of stuff that you couldn't see before and you know uh, understand your patient's condition much better uh, and they also help direct treatment too um sciatica was the first one you mentioned um which is the one everybody knows i got a text from my brother um brother-in-law just yesterday, he has sciatica, and he knows I'm the sciatica guy. Um, sciatica refers to pain that starts in the low back and, and goes down the leg. Um, that's really all it means. It doesn't have a very precise medical term. Um, there are some people who say we shouldn't even use it um, in our notes or in research or in textbooks, that kind of thing. It's very much a layman's term. You know, everyone's mum, granddad, and dog know what sciatica is. William Shakespeare talked about sciatica. It just means pain in the back of the leg, in the back of the low back that goes down the back of the leg. 
Um, so it's an absolutely fine term, patients understand it, but it doesn't have a very precise medical meaning. The next words you mentioned do have more precise meanings. Let's deal first with radiculopathy and then radicular pain. Now, they both have the same prefix there, radic, which means root, which means we're talking about the nerve roots in the spine. Um, so as people know, you have the spinal cord coming down from the brain to about the level of L1. Uh, and we have all our peripheral nerves, with our, our funny bone and our sciatic nerve and, and that kind of thing. And the nerve roots connect the spinal cord to all our peripheral nerves. So in the neck, they branch off kind of horizontally from the spinal cord. And in the lumbar spine, they fall very gracefully like a horse's tail, the cord of equina. Um, and that, this is the nerve roots are kind of the forgotten nerve structures in a way. Like people, we don't really talk about them too much at uni, but do Google kind of nerve roots or cord of equina or something. They're really fascinating structures. These kind of wispy, quite slight nerves, which, as I say, connect the spinal cord to all the peripheral nerves that we, that we know and love and palpate. When these nerve roots are injured, you get quite a, a clear clinical pattern of symptoms, which is different to back pain or different to, you know, a peripheral nerve injury. Um, you get radiculopathy, which is when the nerve root stops working. So radiculopathy is, is not a pain condition, really. It doesn't refer to any particular kind of pain. It refers to a nerve root that stops working. So your patient has weakness or numbness or a lost reflex. So we've all been on a placement or, you know, all in our clinical practice already. And we've seen and probably performed a neurological exam. We've tested our patient, the patient comes in with back pain. And we know to test their sensation, uh, test the strength and test their reflexes. And that's one of the things we're looking out for when we do that exam. Is this patient's nerve root doing its job? So when I, you know, when I put my hand across the outside of his foot, uh, a little signal goes up towards the brain. Is the nerve root carrying that signal up properly? Because if it's not, he won't be able to feel it. And when I ask him to dorsiflex, his brain sending a signal down through the nerve root to his ankle and he's dorsiflexing. But if the nerve root isn't working, then he won't be able to dorsiflex as well. So radiculopathy is when an injury to the nerve root causes people to have numbness, weakness, lost reflexes. Radicular pain is when an injury to the nerve root causes pain. And this pain has quite a distinctive characteristic. Um, so if we, um, again, sticking with the leg, but of course this could all be in the arm as well, it tends to be pretty severe. Um, most commonly, it tends to be down the back of the leg. And it tends to be as bad, if not worse, distally, so below the knee. You know, loads of people come in with back pain that creeps down the bum and the back of their thigh. But every so often, you, people come in with something going on in their back, but it's really bad in their car or even in their foot. That sounds a bit more like radicular pain. And of course, because it's a nerve injury, <clears throat> you also get these nervy signs. So pins and needles, tingling. Um, they might even describe weird sensations like running water or, or burning or crawling, that kind of thing. But radicular pain is quite distinctive, usually severe, usually distal, uh, usually nervy pain pattern that comes with the nerve root injury. Um, I'm really going off on one. <laughs> no, that's that's perfect. I think a, a question is going to come... There's more, there. And... <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. And I think this is going to be a real key thing for, for all of this talk is we're going to be brushing the surface of the things that are useful to know, but there's a whole load of more information you can go and read on all of these mm -hmm. topics. Um, so a question straight away there, Tom, though, is, you know, see, we see patients and yeah, we've all seen patients that, yeah, they've got this pins and needles in, in down into their foot. They've, they've got a bit of numbness, or you might even see a patient that's got a foot drop, for instance. Mm -hmm. But what about those patients who've got pain as well? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so it's in a way, it's kind of one of these things. We have two words for it, radiculopathy, which refers to the, the loss of nerve function. Stuff stops working. And radicular pain, which refers to 
the gain of nerve function. So stuff is working too much. The nerve is firing too much and causing pain. And of course, they're both caused by a nerve root injury, so they both often come together. Occasionally, you'll see people who have a foot drop and no pain. So it's a ridiculopathy with no pain. Mm -hmm. And quite often, you'll see people with ridiculous pain and no numbness or weakness. Yeah. So they have ridiculous pain with no ridiculopathy. Yeah. But then very often, you'll see them both together because yeah. uh, it's caused by the same thing. And an injury to one of those kind of long-hanging nerve roots in, in the lumbar spine. Okay. What's more common still, if I can just say, James, is referred pain. Yes. Yeah. Another R. And referred pain, we see all the time, in all, you know, all over the body, shoulder pain kind of creeps down towards the elbow. And kind of soap opera, someone has a heart attack, you see someone kind of clutch their, their arm. And referred pain is just when you feel pain in an area other than the source of damage, for want of a better word, or the source of nociception. Um, and loads of people have back pain that creeps, kind of aches, diffuse sort of ache in the back of one or both legs. And that's referred pain. Um, but, you know, ridiculous pain, as I say, is something quite distinctive. It's not just pain that spreads, but it's a particular kind of nerve or neuropathic pain um, in, in the leg or the arm. And this is so that's in that subject subject to history. You're going to be listening out for for some of those words that you you've talked about there that are going to tell you an awful lot more about whether you're starting to think down the lines of of radiculopathy or radicular radicular pain in this in this instance. And interesting, you said that that referred pain because I mean I've seen so many patients that have come in and said oh, I've got sciatica, and they've got pain into sort of their buttock, but that's about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think like I think you've probably maybe alluded to before sometimes i let patients have that sciatica terminology oh, yeah. Yeah. and then i explain it in a way that's useful um but yeah. i don't I, I, even when i went went through a stage where we don't use the word sciatica i think it was useful to patients mm -hmm. to have that that term um as long as we reframed it in the right way it was it was good yeah i agree yeah um, the the, my, the book is called Understanding Sciatica, so exactly. You know, uh, so we yeah, know you it, don't it's... mind the term sciatica. <laughs> <laughs> so I think again, we're going to look at this in a very touch in the surface way, but I think it's really good to understand what's actually happening to the nerves. We, we're talking about this radiculopathy, change in function, mm -hmm. radicular pain, where you've got you've got pain listed. What's actually happening mm -hmm. to the nerves, Tom? That's yeah. The most common cause of radicular pain slash radiculopathy i'm just going to say sciatica too yes the most common cause of sciatica is a disc herniation mm -hmm. so as you you know people who are watching and listening know the spine is stacked bones vertebrae and between each bone there's a an intervertebral disc um and the job of the disc is to kind of absorb and distribute force um like any other part of the body, any kind of muscle or ligament discs can become injured. Um, and when they do, they tend to injure in a very specific way. They herniate, which means that the liquidy stuff inside the disc, the nucleus, which has the consistency of like crab meat or phlegm or porridge, that's what people say, stuff inside the disc, which is the kind of the shock absorber, type stuff um herniates basically splurges out of the disc and contacts the stuff around it um so that's what a disc herniation is that the nucleus kind of very as the disc kind of ages or with trauma that kind of thing the nucleus can kind of slowly make its way out and herniate uh, or burst into the outside world these herniations are very common, as people know. A lot of the time they don't hurt. Most people will have had one or two in their life if they're kind of getting to my age at least. Um, but sometimes if they are kind of in a particular location, they will touch one of these nerve roots. Um, so yeah, lots of herniations are very common um, and very commonly don't hurt, but sometimes they do touch these nerve roots. Mm. When they touch the nerve root, they might um, press on the root you know, so as, as anyone who's kind of maybe sitting, listening to this with their legs crossed might know if you press on a nerve for long enough, it'll stop working. I've actually just uncrossed my legs yeah. subconsciously because my foot was going numb. <laughs> if you press on a nerve for long enough, mm. then it stops working because the blood can't flow through it. Um, it's like a, like a dead nerve. That's a terrible way to put it. But like a, 
temporarily stunned Niv. You know, just as if you kind of pinch your hand, it goes white for a second. The skin. Suffocated almost. Yeah. So the, the, the discarnation might do that to the nerve and stop it from working and, and, and damage and injure it that way. But also just because this is an injury, it stirs up loads of inflammation too. So the inflammation also might inflame the nerve. So you get this pressure and you get this inflammation. Um, and both those things together bother nerves. The body's made of tough stuff. A lot of the time people don't even notice this or it's just a little bit of a niggle. But sometimes it can be more severe, and that's when they show up at our door and say, you know, hey, I've got this terrible pain down the back of my leg, uh, you know, and often actually patients don't really notice the numbness uh, and the weakness, right? Because uh, they're, they're not often that serious. Usually it's the pain that brings them in. But when we assess them, they'll go, oh, yeah, now that you mention it, I can't feel my big toe, that type of thing. Okay, yeah, that's brilliant. And I, I suppose I just uh, so I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but <laughs> the, the I think one of the bits that's quite important, I think, to, you know, is in talking to patients and educating patients about what's going on as well is, in terms of a lot of patients will assume that there's there's a physical uh, compression of a nerve, and that's not always the case, is it? No, it's not. I think this is one of those things where there's no clear there's no clear kind of answer. Um, the, um, the prevailing way that patients, but also most clinicians imagine sciatica, radicular pain, radiculopathy, is that there is a disc herniation pressing on and, and squashing a nerve root, which is causing the problem. Um, and that's, I'd like to say that's never the case. Like I'd like to just kind of kick down the door and myth bust and say, oh, it's not to do with pressure or compression actually it, it often is and, and that's why you know people it, it often is but very often actually you know as, as you're implying it seems like it's more to do with inflammation just from the fact that this is a, a kind of disc injury mm. you know, it's herniated everything's you know, it's a, a twisted ankle it's kind of red sore maybe swollen that type of thing a herniated disc you can imagine the same sort of inflammatory soup in the spine and you can imagine that why that would irritate the nerve root um and that probably explains you know why very often people with sciatica don't have um much of a herniation on an mri like there's just a little one that's quite a common story um so it's it's probably a bit of both we, we, you know um and but the key message i think to patients is that uh, um it's unlikely. I wish I could say it's impossible, but it's unlikely that their disc is actually being that their their nerve is actually being kind of squashed and crushed by a disc herniation. And we should do what we can to help them to think of it as more of an inflammatory type condition. So, oh, things are pissed off, irritated, inflamed in there, maybe a twisted ankle like analogy, because that helps them to a it's more accurate in my, in my understanding, but b also it's a little bit less concerning. Yeah. You know, if you just imagine that a disc was squashing your nerve root against your spinal canal, why would you move, exercise? You'd want to take time off work. You would want to do nothing except wait to get surgery. When in fact, if you kind of imagine actually there's a big inflammatory process going on, maybe some gentle movement is good, certainly safe. Uh, maybe I should think about how much I'm sleeping or drink a bit less or you look after my stress levels. Yeah. Um, and maybe I don't just have to wait for surgery and I can try some other things. So I think it's important to kind of help patients understand the inflammatory, irritated, pissed off aspect of things yep. beyond just the mechanical compression. Perfect. And, and that's the key thing in terms of decatastrophizing de 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 and, and allowing that patient to feel more confident. Mm -hmm doing some of the things that we're probably going to ask them to do, um, which is perfect. So, yeah, again, lots more to go into that, but I think that's a really good understanding of, of that um, of that element of what's actually going on there, which we can help patients in understanding as well. So one of the next things we looked at there is, is we, we talked about is how we assess in clinic. And I think we probably covered that a fair bit, to be fair. I think, you know, students will cover quite well their, their, their neurological assessment of myotomes, dermatomes. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing I just want to just pick up because it, it just because you put it up on Twitter recently about we look at those myotomes and dermatomes in, th in theory for that radiculopathy. But then when we talk mm -hmm. about radicular pain, just mm -hmm. very briefly touch on how well does a radicular pain follow a dermatonal pattern? Not very well. 
And I think this is another one of those things where I wish it was a myth where I could say, oh, it's all bullshit. Everything you've been taught is a lie. I used to be that guy, but it's not. It's kind of boringly somewhere in the middle. Um, the key message is that, you know, dermatomes are dermatomes. They're, they're maps of cutaneous sensation. And they do that job fairly well, not, not as perfectly as the textbooks imply. They do that job okay. And there's evidence-based dermatome maps out there. If you just Google evidence-based dermatome map, it's there. Um, as for pain, they don't map out pain very well, um, which, is, which is something people expect, right? If you Google satakiel, you'll see, oh, it follows a dermatomal pattern. Uh, but in fact, you know, the evidence suggests that it doesn't um, uh, simply because that's not what the dermatomes were ever supposed to do. And then for lots of other kind of technical reasons. The bottom line for people listening, I think, is that just, I guess, maybe two things. Just because your patient's <clears throat> pain doesn't obey the textbook dermatome doesn't mean they don't have sciatica, which is quite an important clinical point. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to rule out sciatica just because you're looking at the dermatome textbook and saying, well, it doesn't do that. Yeah. But also, like, if you're seeing loads of patients and thinking, God, none of these people look like they do in the textbooks. What's wrong with me? But actually, there's something wrong with the textbook. <laughs> you know, you know, the, the, the don't the, be reassured when people don't fit the textbook. It's more normal to to not fit and to fit because nerves interlink. They don't do the same thing in every single person because inflammation spreads throughout the body and all that stuff. Perfect. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so the the one that I wanted to touch on because this is something that I really worried about when I was when I was newly qualified, even probably a year and a half into graduating, I'm still concerned about this. So the question is, should we be concerned if a patient is assessed and has abnormal sensation or weakness? So you mm -hmm. suddenly do your myotomes that you've been practicing all this long, and suddenly you go, oh. Oh my goodness okay right they actually do have a weakness here my grade four grade three that's what it actually feels like mm -hmm. how worried mm -hmm. do we need to be mm -hmm. um you mentioned sensation and weakness mm -hmm. sense this is where I, there's obviously like a, a caveat of always to the big picture but when it comes to sensation we're very interested in in a loss of sensation because it implies a loss of nerve function. And, and then we're, we, we become custodians of that nerve. Okay, this person has a, a patch of numbness on the outside of their foot. We need to watch this nerve. Doesn't mean getting them in every day, but we need to educate them, maybe get them in a bit sooner than usual. But at the end of the day, no one's livelihood is affected by a numb foot, except, I don't know, foot painters or I don't know, maybe a ballet dancer, actually, being serious, maybe it is. But most people's livelihood is not affected by a numb foot and no surgeon will operate for a numb foot. Uh, weakness obviously isn't more important. So, so most people will be severely affected if they develop a foot drop. And if, if we as custodians of the nerve allow that to happen without escalating care and getting into imaging and someone who can possibly operate. Um, so yes, we do wanna be a bit more concerned about weakness, especially if it's profound uh so you know one two out of five uh especially if it's um kind of progressive mm -hmm. so if we if we see someone and kind of from one appointment to the other it's got worse we want to be more alert and especially if it's poly root um, so this is me kind of listing them off i think of it as like the three p's profound progressive and, and poly root so especially if it's you know this is where the, actually the myotome charts do help you can look at the myotome chart they have weakness in S1, but also L5 and also L3. If, if you're getting more than one root's worth of weakness and you're more concerned, maybe it's not just a little disc herniation. Maybe there's something more serious going on. In reality, those things are quite rare. And, and I, I think it's safe to say that, that quite quickly we'll develop the clinical pattern recognition to see and feel when those things are happening. It's very rare to meet someone with profound uh, motor weakness mm -hmm. or with multi-root weakness or, or with weakness that's progressing. Um, what you'll more often see is uh, four out of five type. Okay, they, they're, they're, they're weaker. They can do it against resistance, but they can do it. Um, and that's not something to be immediately concerned about. It's going to be something that, you know, you'll probably see hundreds and hundreds of times in, in your career. If you're obviously, if you're a junior, then, you know, you should be 
looking at your well, how things work where you work and should you talk to a senior and things because you know but generally speaking that is not something that needs escalating care and it certainly doesn't need imaging a root you know we're assuming a, a root is being compressed or irritated and so it's not doing its job as well but there's good evidence to show that people who have kind of a mild weakness in their eversion big toe dor uh, elevation dorsiflexion plantar flexion there's good evidence to show those people will not do worse over time right. um, and we can tell patients that it's a perfectly normal response to a pretty common injury and like i say our job is to is to watch over that route or to give them the information so they can do it mm -hmm. so that they know if things are getting worse and, and then we can kind of escalate things then but certainly like any kind of uh, unilateral uh, myotomal weakness is expected and, and not uncommon and um, shouldn't set off too many alarm bells in itself fab no, i suppose it always comes back to that thing if, if you are concerned or you're not sure then asking a senior asking for someone for a, a second opinion is is always the right thing to do in in these circumstances and then you'll stand that way you start to build up a really good picture of what is okay and, and that's a, a safe way to to deal with it like you like you said there so no that's brilliant that's that's fantastic tom um a very very brief one we're going to get to because i want to really want to cover the quarter requirement stuff in a second yeah. but i wanted just to kind of these myths and truths around you know what's like more likely to make sciatica occur in terms of repeated flexion at work lifting heavy mm -hmm. weights in the gym sitting for long periods is, is there much truth to all of that stuff i think again we're in the middle territory here where we yeah. don't get to call it a myth and be smug about it mm -hmm. but also we have to be critical um i don't know it's a short answer i used to think i knew and i used to be the myth guy but the more i read the more the more i kind of end up somewhere in the middle yeah i think um the 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 key thing to think about is that there are three things that contribute to disc degeneration and disc herniation one is what most people expect it to be which is stress load trauma so whether that's doing a, a job for 20 years where you have to bend down or whether it's you know ski going skiing and, and falling having one fall yeah um, so load based issues um and then there's uh disc degeneration which is a kind of a more of a metabolic issue which seems to be driven by general health and things like smoking where the disc just can't stay healthy mm -hmm. um it's really high pressure inside a disc there's not many blood vessels it's not like a skin or muscle where if you get an injury, it heals quite quickly. Discs find it difficult to stay healthy. Yeah. And then there's the big thing, which is genetics. Uh, so if you take a, a, a farmer and a journalist who are twins, mm -hmm. if you take twins and one's a farmer and one's a journalist, and you put them in an MRI machine, they'll have very similar spines. A lot of this is just genetic. I think, so I think it's probably um, a confluence of factors what we can say to patients is probably not to get hung up on any one event yeah. or any one life decision. Like, oh, if only I'd never um, become a sales assistant who stands up all day. You know, if only I'd never become, you know, if only I'd never got into football mm -hmm. uh, and now my spine's damaged because I've been playing football all my life. I think that those things probably have some effect but the picture of your wider health and your metabolic health, mm -hmm. and also the thing you definitely can't change, which is your genetic inheritance, is probably just as much to do with it. Yeah. So it's kind of a shit happens type thing. Yeah. Um, rather than, uh, oh God, I wish I'd never done this. I wish I'd never done that. Fair. And, that, and I think that's a, uh, such an important message for students and new grads watching this is just listening to Tom there, be comfortable about being in the middle. And I think, without going into detail on this you will as students and new grads and, and as and as clinicians be seeing polar opinions on on social media etc and this is a really good example here right now watching this of where being in the middle is usually quite often the best place to be um and being critical about some of the things you see so i'm not going to go off on a high horse about this but it's just really <laughs> nice to hear tom and i think it's something that most of us need to really be comfortable being in the middle it's a it's a great little field right okay so quarter equina we're going to move on to this this is a big big topic um 
what we're going to do now is we're just going to cover sort of what's going on with Corder Aquina, um, how we spot it, why it's an emergency or can be an emergency, and and how we ask the right questions. So that's kind of been the kind of the the framework we're going to go on for this one, Tom. So yeah. Corder Aquina, what is it and what's going on in in a in a brief and concise and <laughs> <lesson> way? <laughs> um, so far we've been talking about an injury to one nerve root. So disc herniations are usual little itty bitty herniations off to the side, and they just kind of catch one root. Uh, and it's a tiny little thing and it causes horrible problems, but that's what we're talking about. That's what sciatica is that we see every day. Corda equina syndrome is when you get a gigantic herniation right in the middle of the spine, which is thankfully very, very rare. Um, but it's the herniation is so big and so central that it squashes and irritates the whole of the corda equina. So before I said the nerve roots in the lumbar spine, they, they hang down before they exit into the bum and the legs. It squashes the whole structure. So rather than just causing the myotomal, dermatomal weakness, that again, I said I said earlier, is not usually anything to be concerned about in the leg, it causes uh, myotomal, dermatomal weakness across multiple nerve roots, including the nerve roots, which are usually very protected, but go into the bladder, the bowels, the sexual organs, and the saddle area. So those roots go right in the middle. They're usually very protected. Discs usually don't get to them, but sometimes with quarter equine syndrome, they do. Mm -hmm. And here we're back to me saying, bit of numbness, bit of weakness in the foot doesn't affect your life. Um, but even a little bit of a loss of function, actually, in the bladder and the bowels and the sexual organs will affect your life quite profoundly. And that's why we're talking about a medical emergency, or actually a surgical emergency, mm -hmm. I should say, with quarter equine syndrome. Yeah. Um, it's unbelievably rare. I think there's a couple, I, I think there was a recent paper, it was one or 200 cases in Scotland in a whole year. So you think how, how unlikely it is that you'll see it, mm. but it's not so rare. You can just forget about it Yeah. <laughs> because actually if you practice clinically your whole career, you probably will see it once or twice, especially if you're a spinal specialist. Mm, absolutely. So with that in mind, then they're, they're coming through the door. So it's something we need to be aware of. What are we looking for? What What is it about cord equina that's going to catch our eye or our ear? So we talk about the, the CES red flags, and then there's a lot of work being done on this recently by a group, uh, Trish Greenhall, uh, James Self, uh, Laura Finnegan, um, who kind of were indebted to for this work, um, for kind of getting the message out there. Um, but the red flags of quarter equina syndrome are bladder dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, a loss of saddle sensation, sexual dysfunction, and bilateral sciatica. And I think most people will know those and kind of be used to asking about them. Um, I'm happy to unpack each one, but I'm also um, I'll probably go off on a bit of a bender and be talking for 15 minutes. I think we. Where do you want to go with that, James? Well, I think no, I think you're right because there, there are some specific ones there, and I think as a student as a, and as a new guy, they are really important to understand. Um, and I am Tom's asked me that I don't don't need to do this, but I am going to just just mention the book um, the, the, what have you, that you've you've written on quarter Aquina, Tom, because this goes into detail about each one, why you see it, why you might see it earlier, later, all of those things, and it does it in such a readable way. So I will put a link in in the in the description for that for that book. But I think it's worth looking at these. I think probably what we do today, maybe Tom, is just go through um, just some of the ones that we might not be so specific about asking and maybe why and i'm thinking around the sexual dysfunction ones some of the ones that really are quite uncomfortable maybe mm -hmm. for new grads and students and i think for some clinicians maybe about those mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i think that the first first thing really is to to say i think a lot of it is about a knowing what you're asking but the b kind of being brave enough to ask and and dumb things down a bit. So this is always my issue was was like, what what we advocate in the book is saying something like, have you had any change when you go for a wee? Have you had any change when you go for a poo? Embarrassing to say wee and poo. I want to say urinate and defecate. But actually what we say is to almost like over a dumb things down mm -hmm. just for the avoidance of doubt and to really kind of get, get things out there and, and be clear 
about about what you're asking because mm-hmm. the 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 temptation as you say or at least for me was always to kind of gloss over these questions and and maybe kind of um certainly what i would always do was ask like um leading questions so say oh you've had no no trouble going to the toilet no okay let's let's move on so the kind of meta thing is to use clear plain language you know as you would with anyone on the street just to make sure they can understand and also to make sure you're not kind of avoiding it to ask a direct question have you had any changes when you have sex it's always awkward to say that but once you start saying it it'll feel better Mm -hmm. um and then, yeah, the thing, I guess, is to know, as you say, about what you're asking, or about kind of what you're listening out for. Do you, would you like to start with sexual fun- dysfunction or with something Either different? Either one, Tom. I, I suppose just mm-hmm. not only this is for you, but I just want to kind of throw in something that I do to see what you think mm-hmm. about it. Oh, please, yeah. The things that I, one of the things I do is I try and frame it first as to why I'm going to ask all these questions. So I usually yeah. give a brief explanation about the cord requirement or what it is mm-hmm. and and why I'm asking these questions. Um, and I don't know how, how that sits, sits through. And also one of the things we used to do was on our assessment sheets, it said bladder or bowel dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And I realized quickly that some of my patients don't even know what that actually means. No. So they'll just yeah. say no, because they don't want to mm-hmm. fear, be stupid. And then when you ask these questions, they've come to a medical professional, they're expecting medical like questions. So I've mm-hmm. never had anyone feel no. weird about me asking apart from me feeling weird so yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's just my my slant on it but yeah <laughs> no i have i've said everything you said i've also said and thought before as well i completely agree with all of that yeah mm-hmm. and they, they will not feel weird if you ask them ask them this stuff nope. um and like i say very simple questions have you had any changes when you go for a wee any changes when you go for a poo um the area um down there kind of around your genitals uh your back passage or your anus the area between the two uh, and the area between your thighs any changes to your feeling down there or when you touch down there can you feel it like normal and then we we also advocate you know you could see as i was saying it there people's eyes probably glaze over as you're describing okay the genitals and the anus and the area between the two demonstrate with your hands where you mean again feels embarrassing but show your patient where you mean have you had any change in your feeling down there? You know, when you touch it, can you feel like touching your arm or does it feel like you're touching the table? That type of thing. Uh, and have you had any changes when you have sex that are not to do with your pain? Because people always say, yeah, well, I can't have sex. It feels, yeah. um, and then, with, you know, with the bilateral sciatica, they've probably already told you about any pain and, and then you can assess them for weakness too. But I think the the, the difficult thing is when people say yes, <laughs> Yes. So have you had any changes when you go for a wee? Yes. And you're yeah. like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> now what do I do now? Yeah. And I think the answer there is to kind of, for me at least, is, is to think about, well, think beyond the red flag. Think beyond, oh, I'm asking about bladder dysfunction now. I'm, I'm ticking the, the, bo- the mm-hmm. box on the form. And think about what you're asking is this person's bladder sending impulses up to their brain through the quarter equina? Because uh, we're asking about a quarter equina injury. Is the bladder able to send impulses up to the brain? So we want to ask, can you feel when you're full? You know, are you urinating less frequently because you can't feel when you're full because those impulses aren't getting up there? Are you even wetting yourself because the bladder fills up and up and up and, and overflows? Um, can you feel when you urinate? So when you, you do urinate, can you feel the urine going out your urethra or can you not feel it at all? So ask questions to get at, can this is this person's bladder sending impulses successfully up to their brain or are they getting blocked at the cord requiner? Mm-hmm. Is this a sensation that uh, questions to do with sensation basically. Mm-hmm. And then the other way around is the person's brain and spinal cord telling the bladder what to do properly. So when the bladder is full, the muscle needs to contract to push out the urine. Um, when you urinate, is the flow normal or does it dribble or sputter or drip out? You know, when you've finished urinating, can you finish properly or does it keep dribbling when you're finished? Um, so one way we break it up is, is that way. You know, you want to ask about can this person feel their bladder? And can this person's central nervous system tell their bladder what to do to, to contract and empty? 
Um, or you can even think about it in terms of, you know, you, you want to ask about, um, we, we call it FFS, uh, changes to frequency, flow, and sensation. So changes to frequency, typically are they urinating less because the nerves are packing in and the bladder is packing in too. Uh, flow, so are the impulses getting down properly or, you know, is it dribbling or sputtering? Do they have to wait sitting or standing at the toilet for 30 seconds before things get going? And sensation. So again, are those impulses going up to the brain? Um, so that's kind of what to do when your patient says, oh, yes, actually, I do have some changes when I go to the toilet. And then you can ask, okay, what are we talking about? Changes to frequency, changes to flow, changes to sensation to get more information. And then again, just ask yourself, be, be clear about what you're doing clinically. Does what is what your patient telling you? Does it sound like a recent injury to their quarter equina? Are they saying, oh, it's been going on forever. It's got a bit worse lately, but it's been going on forever. Or do they say, oh, it has good days and bad days. You know, some, sometimes it's worse in the morning and then it gets better as the day goes on. Those things don't really sound like quarter equina syndrome. And quarter equina syndrome, at least the CES that we're worried about, is an acute um, degenerating condition. So people should be describing something that's come on recently and something that's, if not getting worse, then at least not getting better and having good days and bad days. Right. So, so you're looking for that picture of a deteriorating acute surgical emergency of a nerve condition. Uh, and if your patient's saying, you know, oh, yeah, I've, I've, I've always had... Uh, a bit of trouble I have to stand at the toilet for a while to get going it's always been that way it's been a bit worse since my back pain started but it's basically the same thing that's not too concerning it sounds like the back pain's made everything a bit worse yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. so then for the mm -hmm. bowel for instance so we talk about bladder and bowel function bowel's mm -hmm. a little bit slightly different in terms of that maybe yeah. is it you have the same thing, so it would be changes in frequencies, i.e. going less. Um, so the, the bowel with the CES just shuts down, and people who used to open the bowels once a day then don't, basically. Um, you also have the same thing of a loss of sensation. So you know the bowel and the rectum fill up, sends a message up to the brain, and you feel full, like you need to empty. But people with CES, they don't feel full. So they have um, a loss of... Um, rectal fullness that's the that's the phrase a loss of a sense of rectal fullness um and then again similar to the bladder messages going down from the cns to the bowel telling it to squeeze to evacuate um they don't get through properly so people with ces can't push or bear down to defecate uh so people with ces before they kind of see a, a doctor or a nurse and, and get all the medical equipment they describe having to manually evacuate their bowels with a finger. They just can't do it. Mm -hmm. This is all very different to what's really common, right? Which is constipation. Yeah. So people with constipation, they it kind of sounds like CES because they go less frequently, but they can feel they're full. They're usually very uncomfortable. Very. Um, and they can also push. It just doesn't work when they're pushing. People with CES, the bowel is switched off. If constipation is bunged up, CES is switched off. The thing that's a bit different with the bowel and CES, so anal tone is maintained tonically. So when someone has CES, then the anus loses tone. You get what's called a patchless or wide open anus over time. That manifests as kind of minor accidents, leaking accidents, having to wipe and wipe to get clean after you open your bowels. Um, uh, maybe getting to the end of the day and taking off your underwear and you see that you've had an accident, not just a skid mark, but something more serious. Mm. Typically people won't have felt it because of course they're also numb down there. Yeah. yeah. So you also get like a signs of a loss of anal tone, which is kind of leaking accidents. Mm. Um, but really the bowel, I think the key thing is, I would say the two messages. One is if you're confused, go back to, can they feel it? And, you know, and, is the sensation working and is the motor aspect working? Can they push or is everything starting to pack in basically, which with CES, you, you know, you're looking over a period of days, maybe even hours, sometimes of weeks are things rapidly degenerating in terms of function. 
the other thing I think to mention is your lifeline or your kind of your port in the storm. You're not expected to be or to be a gastroenterologist. You're not expected to know all this, really. Ask your patient, is that normal for you? Because mm-hmm. it's so it's so corny now. It's like a bit of a corny line, or your patient is the expert. But they actually are. <laughs> they know what their bowel usually does. Yeah. They've probably got colitis or Crohn's or IBS or something. So it's not your job to like work everything out. No. Okay, you've got colitis and things have got a bit worse. Is that just because you're in pain and you're taking medications? Or is this a, something different? Is something new and different happening for you? And to a great extent, they know the answer. Is this normal for you, whatever's happening with your bowel? Or has something acutely changed that seems to be getting worse? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, actually, as, as I often say, the patient does know. They, I always say to my patients sometimes, you know your mm-hmm. body 49, 60, 50 years more than I will ever know yeah. it. Um, and <laughs> well, I think yeah. that point is, is really important. And I think that's mm-hmm. covered quarter of quine, I think, because I think one of the things to mention here as well for the, for the audience, I think for the majority of audience listening or who this is aimed at as students and, and new graduates. And I think if you're starting to get into this territory, it's great if you can go into the questions that Tom's gone into in a bit more detail, gather mm-hmm. that, think of your clinical reasoning for why you're asking these and ask them with that in your mind. But you ultimately, from this point, you're then going to discuss this with a senior. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think majority, and I, I might be wrong, but the majority of trusts would expect uh, your, your junior, uh, and certainly whilst you're on placement, to be running this through with a with a senior who will then work with you to a, maybe make that referral to ED or whatever the pathway is within your trust. Um, mm. So in Tom's book, it does talk about making that referral and how to talk to, to ED, which is really useful, but it's just really important that just to highlight the fact that you're not on your own on this one. This is something you would most definitely be including your senior with, and it's a brilliant learning yeah. uh, opportunity. Yeah, it should it should be a team game. I know not everyone will have that luxury, but it should be. And and there's certainly no shame at all. And 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 most seniors, it's one of the key things in the book, talk to someone. Yeah. You know, definitely. not necessarily because you think even if you are already a senior or you think mm-hmm. you know your stuff, because it helps you to organize your mind as well, because this stuff is confusing. Mm-hmm. You know, um draw a timeline, talk to someone to organize your mind. Um, because you can get in the the trenches with CES conversations and you're just the symptom every corner you turn you need to talk to someone to straighten it out um, if you don't mind James I would just say there are a lot of people who are very complacent about CES there's a lot of horror stories out there of patients with CES who have seen um, clinicians who don't know what they're doing who aren't alert who think oh you have if you can walk in you don't have CES or if you're not wetting your pants, literally, you don't have CES, this kind of thing. There are a lot of horror stories, but I strongly suspect that people who are listening to this are not going to be at the complacent end of things. If anything, they're going to be at the, the vigilant end. They've heard a lot about it. They're very concerned about it, as they should be. And I hope what I would say with, with it is, I'm not trying to plug the book, but go, you know, do read up about, uh, Greenhall, Trish Greenhall stuff. Mm-hmm my free stuff on the newsletter and think of it as ways to talk yourself down from that concern which is what it mostly will be yeah or, or ways to help you get out that kind of horrible conversation where you don't you don't know you don't know a and e or wait and see yeah how to kind of get off the fence of that decision the more you know hopefully that the less you'll be referring and the better you'll be feeling about your decision you'll not always get it right Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think that's the message. Like I'm not coming with the message. Shit, we need to be worried about this horrible condition. The, the message is you're probably already concerned, and that's good. Yep. And and with a, a little bit more knowledge, you should hopefully feel more in control of that concern. Yeah, uh, I think that's absolutely perfect. Yeah, definitely. And and I think that it's like a lot of things. You know, that little bit more reading about it, that bit of understanding about it, massively helps you. You you reason through your mind why you're asking these and therefore you usually mm. feel more comfortable asking these questions um mm. but coming from myself it's it's still a bit of an awkward one i still find it a bit awkward but you get as you think you mentioned earlier you get braver just to you've yeah. got to ask it it's it's in your yeah. patient interest to ask these questions um mm. and invariably you come out the other side of it and none of it's it's all fine mm. um and mm. they are certainly not embarrassed yeah. at all 
um, no. but you need just then move on. <laughs> so. And and again, on, on this kind of reassuring, hopefully reassuring for people line is that the thing you don't want to do is just ignore it. And and again, if you got to this point in the podcast or YouTube video, you're not going to ignore it. You're already doing all right. The thing you need to do is your your job. Ask the questions, be careful, listen, talk to someone and make it a reasonable defensive, def, um, excuse, defensible, reasonable, defensible decision. You need to be able to document in your notes. Uh, I talked to my patient about quarter equina syndrome and I decided not to refer them for the following reasons or I decided to refer them for the following reasons. Your job is done. Yeah. You do not have to guess right because there is a lot of evidence that even the most experienced neurosurgeons cannot guess whether someone has CES. You need the MRI to tell you. So your job is not to get it right every time. Your job is to do your job, which will, takes a few minutes, and make a reasonable, defensible decision, and you can go home happy. You've done better than 99% of people champion. Perfect. Perfect, Tom. Brilliant. Right. I am very aware of time and um, I think we've covered an awful lot of information here, but hopefully it's been, I think, well, I'm sure it has been pitched just perfectly for, for the audience that, that we intend on, on this channel. So a massive thank you, Tom. I, we really do appreciate your, your time. You're a busy, busy man. Um, I will, you know, will say that the books that Tom has, has written are are really accessible. So if you're students and new grads, they are, they are, they go into a lot of detail, but they're pitched in a way that's very, very readable. Um, and Tom and I were having a conversation before. I certainly, I use the Quarter Acquire one. I will say I haven't actually read the whole book because I haven't needed mm -hmm. to read the whole book, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. I've read the bits that have helped me on my journey to be more comfortable with this area in, in musculoskeletal physiotherapy. So it's it's one you can dip in and out of. You don't feel like you need to read the whole thing, which is which is fab. Um, and also all the other resources, um, I'll link them all in the, the description below. As Tom puts out loads of free stuff, I recommend following Tom on Twitter as well. Even if you don't use Twitter, just follow Tom, to be quite honest. <laughs> and from there, you'll also get lots of other people to, to follow. So it's, it's you know, a, a lot of useful information on there as well. So, Tom, thank you so much for your, for your time. Um, and I think if we can, maybe in another year or so, we'll get you back on and talk about something yeah. more uh, in the specific detail as, as well at some point. Yeah, I feel like we could have 10 more of these conversations. So maybe I should arrange one. Yeah. Easily. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Right. But I think we put a lot of people's mind at rest to, to make them feel a bit more comfortable about some of these terms and and going on to call the requirements. So massive thanks, Tom. And uh, have, enjoy the rest of your time in the sun. Mm. You haven't got yeah, much. Yeah, thanks, James. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> Tom. Awesome. All the best. Take care. Take care, Bye-bye.